Hey guys, welcome to the Smart Venture Podcast. In each episode, we're going to have conversations with some of the top investors, superstar founders, as well as well-known tech company executives in Silicon Valley. We'll have a coffee chat with them to learn their way of thinking and actionable tips on how they build or invest in a successful company. Before we start our show today, I want to make sure the listener, aka you, understand that everything a person say on the podcast only reflects hers or his own opinion, not the show or the company they work at. Our guest today is a VP at SAP, leading the SAP.io Foundry's North America team to invest in women and diverse lead. B two B intelligence enterprise startups, including AI, blockchain, data analytics, machine learning, and many others. Prior to that, she was the COO of Trigger Media Group at Venture Studio based in New York City. She had a JD from Harvard Law School and worked at McKinsey and Companies for over ten years. Her name is Vanessa Liu. Welcome to the show, Vanessa. Thank you so much for having me, Grace. Vanessa, you founded your own company. Now you're working at a big tech company, help running their venture capital division. To start off the show, I'd love to go back to your early childhood a little bit. You grew up in New York in an immigrant family. At an early age, you helped your parents run their jewelry and electronics store there. At that point, you decided to never start a business. You went to Harvard Law School, worked at McKinsey. Took the traditional successful career path, but you end up starting your own startup. Curious, what influenced your career decisions? Yeah, I, no, thank you, thanks so much for um, for like, gosh, you know, all, all of the research that you've done. I mean, in in terms of when I was growing up, it was less about not wanting to go into startups because I think at that point, you know, it's startups were not a thing. It was more about small businesses and just seeing how my parents, like immigrant parents, Mm -hmm. really just toiling week after week, we would go to Queens Plaza in in Queens. There was a flea market there. We would set up shop and that was what I would do on weekends. And, um, And I just remember just seeing how hard my parents worked. And I always just felt like, gosh, you know, when I grow older, I don't only want to do this. I want to be able to just be able to have more change, but I knew like this was what they chose so that we can have a stable foundation. Mm -hmm. And it was more about that, that I just felt like for sure, retail is a very hard business, but also not being able to truly affect more customers and the ones that you have um, at hand. It's, Mm -hmm. it's really tough, but you know, when I was at McKinsey, my I fell into this niche where I started helping media companies figure out what their digital growth strategies were. And this was at the height of the first dot-com boom. Mm-hmm. And I remember the third project that I was on was to help an insurance company build a free internet service provider business. Mm-hmm. And so that back in the day, that was a really, really popular thing to do because you can have a captive audience if you can provide them free internet. Mm -hmm. And I remember the insurance company was just like, could you just figure this out for us? Like start to finish, including the portal. And and that was back in the day when when portals were really big, right? There was AOL and everybody who dialed up to AOL would have Mm -hmm. a portal and that was valuable real estate. And I remember going around this was based in the Netherlands at the time, striking up business development deals with like just these new, these new internet upstarts. And it was like the most exhilarating work because at the end of nine months, we had built up a free internet service provider business. It became the fourth largest um, ISP in the Dutch market and was sold you know, shortly thereafter. And I just became hooked. I was like, that was just so exciting how we were able to build something from scratch. Mm-hmm. And then, and, and, and we're just able to have something to point to that had such an impact on um, a large segment of the population. So that was my calling card. I did that again and again and again. So even though I was with a traditional management consulting firm, the work that I was doing was far from what the traditional consulting work was because mm-hmm. it involved business building as well as the strategic planning. 
And I did it for nine and a half years. I was, I loved it. I loved so much in terms of working with our clients. But towards the end, I started thinking, you know, gosh, you know, they're going to run that business. If I were in their shoes, I would be running it differently. I mean, at that point, I had seen what our clients were doing. And I just had this itch I had to scratch in terms of wanting to start my own business to see what that was like. So I was lucky enough to join forces with a business partner to launch a venture startup studio. So that was the journey to becoming an entrepreneur. I think that's really cool. Coming from an immigrant family, sometimes stability is really highlighted. Does your parents force you to study? I think studying law, passing the exams takes a lot of dedication. Jumping into work in startups is kind of like the opposite of being at McKinsey or SAP. They're pretty much led to different lifestyles. What motivated you to make the switch? You know, I've never really thought of them as so drastically different. It's almost like extensions of one another. And you know, I was really lucky that to to grow up in a household where, you know, obviously, I think a lot of Asian immigrant parents definitely think about academics first. But if anything, my parents were always saying to me, just believe in yourself. I think because they're both entrepreneurs, that they always say, just believe in yourself. And um yeah, they they definitely instilled in me a very strong work ethic. And I thought I was going to be a scientist for the longest time. So I, mm-hmm. when I went to college, I went to Harvard College, I studied psychology, but with a behavioral neuroscience track, because I thought mm-hmm. I was going to be a neuroscientist down the road. Mm-hmm. And I started meandering when I realized like my senior year, waking up one day and thinking, I just don't think that that is my calling. I just think that there's something, there are other things that I could do, which can have more impact. And so that's how I've always been looking at the things I do in my life. Like what impact am I going to have? When I, when I joined McKinsey, I I joined because I just felt that business and being able to aid in economic development can really affect just, you know, very, very large systemic change. And on the startup front, it's more about, you know, getting down to the essence, you can actually create jobs from scratch, which is incredibly fulfilling. And it's, it's really like a calling. So I haven't, I never thought about it as like a really big jump. Yes, you don't have the resources around you, but Mm -hmm. it felt like a very natural development because I had always been helping our clients build new businesses. And so within the framework of what my business partner and I were doing, we were looking at these business models that had been tried and true. And we just felt that this was the time to be able to do that because there had been just proven examples in media and social commerce that this could work. Yeah, totally. I do see your point. Essentially, both startups and big tech companies were solving problems for people. You got invited to speak at so many panels and events. You seem like have great relationships with many people. Who is on your personal board of advisors and how do you intentionally build a good network? Yeah, you know, this is something that even from a very early age, like I've always been, and maybe maybe it's because I'm like more of an old soul. Like I always (laughs) got along with my teachers and professors. It started off when I was in in middle school, really, my seventh grade teacher, Miss Ellen West. So if you're listening, Ellen, I definitely (laughs) want to do a shout out to you. We keep in touch still, but she just took me under her wing and she actually exposed me to the world of of, of, um, space and, Mm -hmm. and being a young astronaut. And that was just so exciting. And I remember, um, just how much that meant to me. And then when I was 14, I was picked as part of this NASA delegation to go to what was then the former, I mean, what was then the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And, and it was with a chaperone who was a NASA astronaut. And we were visiting, um, it's like basically the Soviet star city and what their space program was like. And that commander, Dave Walker, became one of my mentors. And so I just felt like at an early age, I had just had these, you know, wonderful people who just took me under their wing and not only took me under their wing, but just really just paved opportunities for me. Mm -hmm. And I think I was just 
so lucky. And I think a lot of it has to do with just being able to connect with people on a very deep level. When I was at McKinsey, I was just, you know, also just so lucky to work with incredible, incredible mentors um, like Wendy Becker and David Bonello and Steve Hasker. These are people I still talk to on a daily basis, not on a daily basis, but like on a regular basis. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, when, when you're able to find people who you can really connect with and like, of course they're pounding the pavement for you. It makes you think, gosh, you know, I just want to be as hopefully as helpful and as, as just like, um, a great sounding board to them as well. And it's more about developing deep friendships as well as, you know, cultivating these special relationships where like you have amazing sponsors. So I think that's the glue is that they are all incredible people. They're very giving. They really believe in, in cultivating talent. And also at the end of the day, like they are just um, lifelong learners too. And I think that's like what draws them to, to always meet people and to help people. Yeah. I mean, I also heard about the astronaut piece. You mentioned you had four friends who also want to be astronaut and when you grew up and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. it was so cool. Um, would you say people in your circle are mostly people who is your mentors or folks who are more senior than you? Later on, you kept in touch with people you've worked with. They all seems like folks in your existing network from school and work. Do you ever had to actively building relationships outside of the workplace? Yeah, no, I think like over over the last few years at SAP, I could tell you one of um, like uh, there, there have been like a few people who I just feel so blessed to have also bring in as into my personal board of advisors. And um, and there are these incredible women who are investors mm-hmm. and, and former executives. And they, you know, what's, it, it wasn't like I was actively seeking them out. It was more like I, um, we had the chance to meet in, and I was just like, wow, you're just incredible. And would just love to be able to spend time together. And, and what's so interesting is that we do have very similar outlooks on, on getting to know people, being able to give back. Mm-hmm. And it is something that you know, I think a lot about, like it's, you know, when it, you, if someone asked me, a founder asked me, actually, mm-hmm. do you think it's possible to make friends after you are 30, 35? And I jumped in. And I said, of course, you know, actually some of the really deep relationships I have now were cultivated after that age. And I think it's because you know yourself a lot more mm-hmm. about what motivates you, what your values are, and you gravitate towards those people who have similar values and similar outlooks. And then, you know, that you gel very easily with them. And, 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 you know, some of these folks are, you know, 20 years, my senior or more, but it doesn't feel that way because we have very similar outlooks on life. Yeah, a hundred percent. I feel like it's all about if you have similar value with someone, age or background kind of less relevant. You have a great career. You went to Harvard Law School, worked at McKinsey, now at ICP. What do you think is one skill that you're constantly trying to get better at? It could be self skill like communications or sales or technical skill like coding or financial modeling or maybe even law. For me, it's actually about managing conflicts. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? Conflicts come up in obviously every aspect of life. And, you know, from the moment that you're born, and if you have siblings, you know that incredibly well to down the road, like in terms of team dynamics, Mm -hmm. uh, working with other people, working just, you know, with different groups. Mm -hmm. And I think about conflict resolution as something that at least to someone like me doesn't really come naturally. Like I'm a natural conflict avoider. Mm -hmm. And and it's something I've really had to hone and, and confront and like work on. And I still work on to this day. Like, I think that especially now in this day and age of a very polarized society, how do you bring 
sides together who are really far apart. And Mm -hmm. it's actually part of the reason why I really enjoyed law school. I had the chance to dive in and really get to get to get schooled on negotiations and conflict resolution. And, you know, to the point where I was just lucky enough to have been a teaching assistant in those classes. And it's something I'm still interested to this day. And, um, and the whole idea of emotions, when you are in the middle of a conflict, how do you manage that better? So you could be a better leader. So you could be a better manager. So you could be a better colleague. So you could be a better mother or, or, you know, daughter or sister, you know, or mom, like there are so many aspects to it. So this is like one skill, which I'm sure I'm going to be constantly working on till the day. I don't I feel you. It's definitely something requires us to intentionally trying to improve on. A lot of times I do the same. I try to keep the opinion to myself so I don't have to offend people. But sometimes we need to voice our opinion or two parties seeing things differently. It could be hard to manage. Going back to your career development journey, you pivot into working at a startup after Harvard Law School and McKinsey. How did you make that switch? How did you meet your business partner and decided to go into business together? Yeah, so um, I met my business partner, Andy Russell, through somebody who became a co-founder of our first business. So John Keaton. So John and I, had uh, known each other from our McKinsey days and he was based in the New York office. I was based in the London office. And though we had, we didn't have a chance to work together closely while at McKinsey, we knew of each other. And I remember catching up with him after I had moved back to New York. And he said like, look, you know, I'm thinking about founding this business in, in media with this person, Andy Russell, who would be at the portfolio company level. And he's actually looking for a business partner. Would you be interested? And I remember thinking like, oh, you know, what a, what a, you know, interesting uh, type of approach in terms of this venture startup studio idea. And, Mm -hmm. and that's like how Andy and I met, we had very similar outlooks on how we wanted to build teams and the types of businesses we were interested in, his background was actually in investing. And so he mm-hmm. was at a private equity group that did a lot of media investing. And, and that's actually where he did a lot of um, investments, including Daily Candy and Thrillist mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and built those types of businesses. And the whole idea was that we were going to build similar businesses. And so mm-hmm. when we first met, which was like in 2011, just felt like these were very exciting businesses to pursue. Yeah, I think I saw that he was on the board of Thrillist at one point. So you guys trying to start a venture studio that incubates media brands slash companies back then. What were the kind of companies did you guys trying to build? Nowadays, there are many incubators out there. But assuming back then the trend was just starting, how do you guys got started? Yeah, we, you know, we were very much into building businesses that had a few characteristics revolving around them, like businesses that, and actually looking at from a psychological lens, actually, because these were consumer businesses, businesses that would give you recognition and, and those that were, you would have like appreciation where, um, you know, was, was your ego stoked, like really thinking about it from, from that lens, like your reputation, is that something that's going to enhance your reputation? And we were also looking at, you know, several different demographics. And so our first business uh, was a business called Inside Hook, is a business called mm-hmm. Inside Hook, and it's, it mm-hmm. still is going really strong today. The whole idea was that these would be, uh, it, this in, in its infancy was an email newsletter targeted at discerning men, 35 to 55, and who would would just need a tip a day because in their very busy lives, if they can be told what to do, where to go, what to buy, what is cool, this is something that would enhance their reputation, mm-hmm. give them recognition for like being in the know. Um, those were the types of businesses that we were thinking about. Our second business is called Fivo, and it now um, at, at the core of it is uh, a social commerce business. And so we power the group ticketing 
for about 75% of the the sports teams in the US across the five different main professional sports leagues. And the whole idea is that it's about you as a person being able to get your friends and your friends' friends to go out and experience something together. And so you get recognition again mm-hmm. for doing that. If you were to mm-hmm. be the person that brings things together, you get a, a reputation for doing so. If you can, you know, be the person who can execute on that again and again and do it well. So these were the types of businesses we were thinking about that could at the core really serve a consumer need. And, you know, there are, there were so many changes going on in media at the time. Like if you think about where media was in 2011, fast forward to like 2015, fast forward to now where it's morphed so much, right? Like the, like think about like the, kind of like the the boom of brands such as Vice and BuzzFeed and Upworthy and then now like the plateau and like decline of these types of properties it's and and it's the rise of other types of properties that have come in their wake it's it's changed so much over the last decade just in terms of what the media landscape would be of course we anticipated a lot of change and um you know, we probably didn't anticipate it changing as much as it has, mm-hmm. but um, I think at the core of it still, it's about how do you get to particular demographics? And I, I'm very bullish on identity-based businesses. And we're seeing a lot of that nowadays. If you look at, for instance, the retail the retail e-commerce market, and you look at grocery retailers like we, that's out on the West Coast, that's serving mm-hmm. um like the Asian um, online yeah. grocery yeah. segment, right? Like that is taking off or there's like, um, there's uh, a, a, another, another one called Amsam, which is basically Vietnamese or Thai or Chinese um, sauces. And they're selling it all online D to C like these types of brands that are very identity based, you see them growing more and more. So it gets to the core of mm-hmm of like, you know, who you are as a person. So just thinking about those types of businesses was was at the core of what we were trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. I thought you guys were really forward thinking in terms of growing a newsletter back in 2011. Nowadays, newsletter is a big trend. Everyone's on Substack. People are reading Morning Brew, The Skim, Robin Hood Snack. When you guys started in 2011, 20- 11, what were your prediction on how the media was going to shift in 2020? Also, can you elaborate on the business model of a venture studio for the audience who may not know? Yeah. So let's take that, let's tackle that first. So I mean, there are many different types of venture mm-hmm. studios nowadays. Like what we defined it as was that we wanted to build businesses from scratch, find management teams to do so, and be the primary investor towards like a specific point. I think you see so many permutations of that nowadays, right? You look at science down in LA and um, they, they do, you know, very much like have the same type of approach, but like their check and how far they're willing to go is probably not as, um, not as far. You have like human ventures, which is, you know, in New York city, which is doing a lot of that. You look at atomic nowadays and, Mm -hmm. and what they're doing out in the Bay area like for us, it was more that we knew that there were these business models that were proven. So you mentioned email newsletters. That's actually a business model that's been around a long time. Like mm-hmm. Daily Candy as a business, I don't know if many people in the audience remember that, but back in the day, that was the email newsletter for young women, 20 to 30. I still remember being a Daily Candy subscriber. Mm-hmm. And living in London at the point and there was like a London version. I was like, thank goodness there's one. So I like know what is great and new and exciting that's opening up in the city. And it was like a very novel and there's something really intimate about that medium that email provides, which, um, you know, now when you think about texting, texting also provides that, but like, that's like a very, intimate one-on-one relationship that you build with your readership base. And if you can tell what they like over time, you can actually develop like a very interesting profile and all of these types of subscribers. And so 
like looking at the skim and the morning brew, like these types of businesses, I'm not surprised that those have sprung up because like these types of businesses have always resonated very well with consumers because it makes you feel very smart to be able to digest the day's worth of headlines. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, look, I have a tidbit. I think there's this one newsletter I subscribe to, which is a fantastic one called the exponential view by Azim Azar. He has a section which says short morsels to make you appear smart at dinner parties. I think now it's like short morsels to make you appear smart on zooms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these are just like very interesting tidbits and facts, but it's, it gets to the whole notion of how we are all time starved and because you're time starved, then what can you do to make you just make the most of the time that you have? A lot of it is about having the right information at your fingertips. For sure. What do you think is today's equivalent of daily candy compared to today's newsletter? What are some biggest change in the space? I feel like for a while, newsletter wasn't as big. Why do you think it became trendy again? Yeah, I don't know if it's becoming a trend again. I don't think it's ever really gone away. I think there are some formats which just do incredibly well. And I think when it comes to news, right, the morning brew, the skim that you mentioned, these are news driven offerings. I actually mm -hmm. think that when it's action oriented, then it's more interesting. Mm -hmm. And like, for instance, like knowing, knowing, um, the, the sample sale that was going to be like around the corner. That's how daily candy started. Mm -hmm. And so that was very action oriented. You knew that the moment you opened it, Oh, there might be something for me to take action on. Mm -hmm. The news is mu much more about you know, staying abreast of what's going on. And, mm -hmm. and so that you can, you can ensure that you're just on top of uh, basically current events, but the action part, I think is something that hasn't gone away. And if you think about nudges and how you can nudge people to do certain behaviors, I think a lot of it is about being able to say like, Hey, you know, why don't you try this or do that? If you think about Robin hood and how that app is so addictive, right? A lot of it is about the nudges that, um, mm -hmm. that they've deployed on the app for you to take certain actions. And then, so I think that when it comes to newsletters, that's why I don't think they've gone away. It's more that they've just more in vogue again. Absolutely. I feel you. I never thought about the taking action piece. You are right. If there is something you can implement to your daily life after reading the newsletter, it's more of a motivation to actually go through it every day. When you guys started the Venture Studio, your team raised $22 million from Guggenheim Partners, Allen and & Company, and other venture firms. When it comes to raising funding for a media company, I know that your partner had some investing track record. How do you guys identify your superpower? And how do you guys show that to the investors? Yeah, so he, he definitely had an incredible uh, roster of investors just from his prior work, and also just given his track record. And so in terms of our funding, we were able to to raise it just in a matter of a few months. And so when I came in, it was just there to more, uh, you know, ensure that the deals were closed. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of it does speak volumes of, you know, back then. And I think also now there is a lot of capital for people who are in the right networks. And that's actually something that I recognize early on that if you don't have access to those networks, it's actually a really tough game instead, mm -hmm. right? Which is why it's just thinking about the VC landscape and, and how it is so important for that to become more diverse, like at the GP level, LPs should also be demanding that, that VC firms are more diverse, not because it's just good like for the social good, but because it's actually better from a performance standpoint mm -hmm. and, and thinking about that. So I, you know, I, th I think about this was a decade ago, like to be able to raise so much money so quickly. And then you see, you fast forward now a decade mm -hmm. to where we are now in 2021 and how those companies that have the right investor networks are able to raise so much. And that was the story of all of 2020. Like, I think everybody was saying like, wow, what a banner year in venture capital. 
it was for those founders that have the right networks, but for those founders that didn't have those networks, it was really Mm -hmm. tough. It was actually tougher than it has ever been. Yeah, I feel you. I know that you are a big supporter of the minority founders and female founders. There are less female GP on the table. What do you think are some ways that female and minority founders can do to be better at fundraising? Well, I think there there are a few things. One is definitely getting the access to networks. And I think programs like what we have at SAP, which are focused on creating an ecosystem of partners. Mm-hmm for for our customers, but in the form of startups like that, the, the, those are the companies who are providing the innovations, actually play an incredibly important role in leveling the playing field because they provide access to thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of customers. So if you can get that, that makes a huge difference. So that's like number one. Number two, I think when it comes to the actual talking to investors, just thinking about the audience, there is a lot of emphasis placed on ambition, placed on also going out there and raising probably more than you actually need. So I always say to founders, especially those who are underrepresented, like I know that your numbers are really buttoned up, but have you actually thought about maybe asking for 2x, 3x of what it is that you are asking for? Because well, number one, the funding landscape right now is a very attractive one. And so if you can go for more, like go ahead and do it. But also secondly, you know, I think a lot about what, um, you know, I always, always like, I, I always hear my friend Cindy Gallup saying like, what would that straight white male do? They would be asking for two or three X more than actually <laughs> And what they need and painting that picture. So that's what I always say, like, what would other people do in your shoes who do get the money and, you know, adopt that type of an approach, but also it's really important to, to think about the, you know, paint the vision, paint the upside. I think a lot of the founders I work with because they are so responsible are so focused on but that is the story that comes out. It's like, oh, you know, we know that we'll be protected from X, Y, and Z. It's not about protection that you're starting there that you need to sell. It's a story about growth. Mm. And so, you know, making sure you're focused on that is really important. Absolutely. That's a great advice. I feel like a lot of times female founders are really trying to be responsible and play it safe. We sometimes worry more about if we could return the capital than shooting for the highest number. I think it's great to think more positively about the outcome and be more ambitious on growth and the number you're asking. You helped SAP launch the SAP.io Foundry programs. What do you think were some challenges that people underestimate to launch venture and startup cohort programs within big tech companies? Yeah, you know, there are now so many companies trying to do accelerator programs Mm -hmm. and just thinking about like, how do you work with startups? And I think it's hard to get it right. Mm -hmm. And so I, when I joined SAP three years ago, I was really taken by the vision that our then CEO and our chief strategy officer were painting in that this is about cultivating an ecosystem Mm -hmm. and being able to be essentially honest brokers to our network of over 400,000 customers who are looking for innovations Mm -hmm. and solutions to specific pain points that they know that SAP won't provide, but they want to be able to see on our platforms because they've invested so much in SAP Mm -hmm. solutions. And, you know, this approach of saying like, look, we can go outside and cultivate this ecosystem in companies that are, you know, perhaps like really early that are at the seed stage or, you know, series A or B stage, like a little bit more mature is a novel one because a lot of customers won't necessarily have the the time, the resources to be able to find these types of companies. So it is about being very deliberate, but what was really different about what we were doing was that at the get-go, we said that this ecosystem had to be reflective of what, you know, 
general society represents and also what our customers are, are mm-hmm. represent and also who they also reach. So this focus on inclusive entrepreneurship was what was so distinctive about it. We did that from the get-go. Our first New York program in 2018 mm-hmm. was a cohort completely dedicated to women entrepreneurs in enterprise tech. And since then, we've we've stated a, a public commitment called No Boundaries, where at least 40% of the founders that we work with globally are underrepresented. And a lot of companies who are now starting their accelerators come to us and ask us for advice. We just had a call earlier this week where this one large financial institution mm-hmm was asking us, well, that's so different. You mean you don't have a specific program for underrepresented founders and then a regular program for just general enterprise tech? We said, no, this is baked into everything that we do. And you have to be that way. It should not be like a side project. Mm -hmm. It should be something central to your core business because only in that way can you make a true difference and an impact in how the face of technology is going to look. Mm-hmm. I think it's great that you guys primarily focusing on the underrepresented founders, especially at the beginning. How do you pitch a program like this to a larger organization with multiple stakeholders? Do you have to convince people at the top or it was really cohesive throughout the organization? How do you demonstrate the financial benefit from this program to people? Yeah, no, of course, Leadership starts from the top. So you Mm -hmm. need to have leaders who really truly believe that inclusive entrepreneurship, this is not about charity. This is actually about better business. This is about Mm -hmm. better returns. There's so much research out there that shows that diverse teams outperform those that are not diverse. And there are a lot of companies out there that are being overlooked because they haven't been in the traditional network of just like of of venture capital, for uh, for Mm -hmm. instance. So you need to have people at the top who truly believe that in order for one Mm -hmm. of these types of programs. Well, any program, if you just look at any innovation program with a company, it can't just be something that is done on the side as a hobby. It has to be something Mm -hmm. like a central part of your strategy. And, And so this is the same when it comes to saying, well, if we're going to do and do this type of program, focus on innovation. How are we going to do it? At SAP, we were asking ourselves, we always say we're going to help you know, businesses run better. And mm-hmm. but better for whom? And how and with what type of technology? And you realize very quickly that you have a moral imperative to make sure that the solutions that are chosen are those that are going to be truly distinctive, but also representative at the same time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that type of of um, strategic mindset comes from recognizing that it is about about better business and performance Mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Yeah, for sure. From my understanding, SAP is doing business with a lot of bigger companies. I believe you guys were primarily investing in companies that already have some track record that are Series Bs and later. For this program, it seems like you guys were targeting earlier stage Correct me if I'm wrong. What's a financial outcome that you guys are thinking this program could potentially generate for the company? Yeah. So actually, we we have um, a fund where SAP is the largest Mm -hmm. LP. That's Sapphire Ventures. So those have that. I mean, there the portfolio there has been traditionally focused on growth companies, so Series B and beyond. But SAPIO is focused on earlier stage. Um, and about strategic investments. Sapphire is no longer about strategic investments, but more financial investments. And when it, I mean, when it comes to these types of investments and thinking about what are the KPIs, right? It's all about thinking about the win, win, win all around. Mm -hmm. So a win for SAP is if we are cultivating a strong enough ecosystem for our customers so that they find their SAP investments just even more sticky. And how do you do that? It's about finding point solutions and integrating them onto SAP so that you can access them that much more easily. These are, you know, our, our core business um, is working with very large enterprises. We, we consider companies 
of revenue, a billion dollars and below SMBs, which is not the definition that a lot of that a lot of other companies have, but that just goes to show the type of focus that we typically have. And it's it's great financial return, we know at the end of the day, if we know that a customer is going to re-up or a customer is going to pick our like our technology stack over others because Mm -hmm. we are offering a very robust, distinctive ecosystem. Absolutely. When it comes to building the ecosystem, there are big tech companies that are building similar programs. What do you think are the advantages that SAP has that help stand out from the competitions? Well, you know, the way I look at it is that it's, it's, it's great that there are so many opportunities mm-hmm. for startups to loop into different ecosystems. And then like that type of approach makes a lot of sense. You know, where we find like the challenges now we're four years in into building SAP IO. We just celebrated our four year birthday this, this mm-hmm. past week. And we've now worked with over 300 companies globally. And it gets to the point where it's like having lots of children where you just, you're, your attention gets divided so thinly across all of the companies you've actually worked with. And so being able to Mm -hmm. continually assist these startups, not just when they're in program, but afterwards Mm -hmm. is something that we would love to be able to focus more on. I also just think of uh, so much about not just the companies that we have worked with, but many others who apply to our programs, but we just don't have the capacity to take in every company that we meet what else is it that we can do so that we can help them? That's something that we've been thinking a lot about too. I think in this day and age where you know there's Clubhouse, there mm-hmm. there are obviously so many Zoom webinars, probably way too many, and I think there's just significant fatigue right now. But you know, being able to democratize the type of work that we do and to be able to mentor many different businesses beyond the ecosystem is also something that we think about as well, because I think that's also something that would make us feel good about helping underrepresented founders um, at a greater scale. Of course, in terms of building that program, what's your day-to-day like now? How do you evaluate your progress? How do you set up the KPI for yourself? Now that's, so we just kicked off our spring programs for New York and San Francisco. We are focused on the future of work for our San Francisco cohort, where we're working with six incredible companies. We just kicked off our professional services cohort, where we're working with companies that are working with the big four accounting firms and management consulting firms, like professional services firms. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to like the work that we do now, this is like a 12 week sprint to make sure that these companies are integrated into SAP, that they also learn what it's like to work with SAP, that they learn what it's like to sell alongside us and that we figure out the go-to-market path together. So that's a lot of ground to cover in 12 weeks. So every single week we're measuring what is it that we're going to do. It's a very planned and orchestrated type of program, but which is also very customized to the companies that have come in. When it comes to creating a program like this, it probably requires a lot of network building, creating these curriculum, designing the program. What are some tips and tricks? Where do you normally get your inspirations from? So we were uh, like really lucky early on to have been partners with Techstars. And mm-hmm. uh, this was before I joined SAP. But um, like SAP was working together with Techstars on an Internet of Things um, a program in in New York, and so mm-hmm. of course, like they have an incredible curriculum. But also, a lot of it was thinking, just coming from the founder angle, what mm-hmm. what is it that like I would have really wanted just in their mm-hmm. shoes, and also being a former management consultant, everything is about problem solving, right? And so just thinking about, well, what would make most sense and for these, you know, for these startups that could provide that win, win, win all around. And so it's a lot of, in in the beginning, I actually love the curriculum design because you're thinking and onboarding these companies, they're telling you what would really move the needle for them. And you're just thinking, well, you know, if only I could bring in someone who is an expert at X, Y, and Z, that would really help them. And so that's like what we think a lot about, but it is about just trying to solve the biggest problems for these startups and also for our customers and being 
you know, very, very much solution oriented. If you're a first time founder, how would you approach the fundraising process? What's the criteria the company have to meet to be admitted to a program like yours? Yeah, so these programs are really targeted at those companies, enterprise tech companies that have a solution that could be complementary to what we do at SAP mm-hmm. and where integration makes sense. So a lot, there are a lot of companies out there where like they just don't know if integration is going to make sense. They're going to have to think about it down the road. This is like, this is a commitment. And so you would have to make sure that this is something dedicated that you would want to commit to. And a lot of it comes from customers that you have who might ask, Hey, are you going to integrate into SAP? That would be more valuable. So that's the type of criteria that we look for. If you're a first-time founder, how would you research investors? What characteristics would you look for in the investors or folks who may be potential board of advisors for your company? How do you interact with them ahead of time to make sure they're the right people to team up with? So like... In terms of partnering up with the right people, it's it's about finding those companies that are high growth, of course, mm-hmm. that are distinctive. So we want to make sure that their business is is like um, is is something that is is really unique. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's like the type of criteria. It's like very very similar to criteria to what VCs look for, which is you know what problem are you trying to solve? What solution do you have? What is the founding team like? The criteria that we have is very similar to that. And then we just layer on the additional, can we help you as SAP? If you're a founder without much of an existing network, how would you build relationships with investors? How would you make sure you have a powerful network to leverage on ahead of time before you started fundraising? So, you know, when it, when it comes to cultivating relationships with with investors, this is something that you should just do early, right? Mm-hmm. It's not just about when you're like, well, you know, I need to go out and raise money. It, this is very much a relationship-based type of, you know, of game, unfortunately, mm-hmm. which goes back to what we were saying before, like one of the big issues is about access to networks. And so try to cultivate those networks early, really think about where you can grab that. So, you know, I was lucky enough to be able to draw upon um, my network at McKinsey draw upon like my network at at Harvard to be able to lean on when it comes to finding great mentors for these startups and there are also great investors for these startups. So I think if people really think at the get go, w- what does success look like? A lot of it is about cultivating an advisory board that is going to help you open doors, and so that's something that we tell our find our, our founders all the time to do. Totally. When it comes to creating relationships, besides networking with alumni from school or previous work, especially underrepresented founder, they may not have existing networks. How would you reach out to people to get connected? And what can they offer to create these kind of relationships? You know, I think that in, in this day and age where so many of us are available to be searched on on Twitter or on Clubhouse or on LinkedIn, I would say reach out. Like I love speaking to founders who just cold email me. I think that's so gutsy of them to do that. And I think it's great. So I actually reserve time to do that. And so I and I don't think I'm in I'm alone or in the minority in thinking of that. Like I think it's so important to be able to have open doors. So that's something that um, I would encourage founders to do, to reach out to people. And you could find me on LinkedIn to do so. Of course. Yeah. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Uh, We're in the last fire round session. So I have a couple questions for you. One is, uh, what's your favorite book? My favorite book is, you know, I actually have several, (laughs) Um, but the one that I would Mm -hmm. say I go to again and again and again is a book called Tuesdays with Maury. And it was about this uh, relationship between um, this, I think it was like a student and and his teacher. And it was just over a long period of time. And also the time that he spent with him in his last weeks of life. Wow, that's deep. <laughs> uh, who made the biggest impact in your career? My mother. She 
is an entrepreneur that I very much look up to. She was a feminist before it was a popular thing to do. So many people discounted her when she was starting her business when I was younger. And, you know, that type of courage is something that keeps me going because I know that if my mom was able to do that back in the day when it was just so much harder, like it should be that much easier for me nowadays. And so she's my big inspiration. Totally. Um, Who would you invite to your dinner party? So we were talking about Commander Dave Walker. So he unfortunately (laughs) passed about 20 years ago, actually 20 years ago, about now. And I so miss him. I just really wish that I can just have a chat with him, just to talk to him and, you know, about all the things that have been happening in life. And, and I just really want to share that with him. Totally. Where can we find you outside of work? (laughs) <laughs> so I'm usually running around uh, with my kids or biking with them currently based in the Netherlands, but we will be going back to New York city. And, and I, I love walking or, and biking. And so you'll probably find me walking somewhere or biking somewhere. Awesome. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for coming on to the show today. Thank you so much for having me. All right. That's all we have for today. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Smart Venture Podcast. If you like it, please leave us a quick review and hit subscribe so you don't miss any tips from the experts. If you want to receive our updates, please leave your email at smartventurepod.com. If you want to connect with me, all my socials are at GraceGongGG. Besides LinkedIn, it's just Grace Gong. I'd love to connect with you and let me know your thought about the show. Now you can also listen to Smart Venture Podcast on YouTube. Go to smartventurepod.com, click the YouTube link on the top banner. Don't forget to hit subscribe and smash the like button. See you next time.